Hi, everybody. Juliana Forlano here. You're watching Act Now. I can't tell you how excited I am about our show today, although I am excited about all our shows. I'm just happy to be here with you, enjoying the end of civilization as, as we see fit. Are we allowed to keep a positive attitude? I hope so. That's kind of what Act TV does. We show you, in case you're new to this program, we, we talk about what people are doing to fight the onslaught of uh, injustice that's coming from all areas. One of the as a former media studies professor, I often like to talk about how the mainstream media is failing us. I remember when I started my professorship, uh, nobody knew that that was the thing. And now it's kind of cool because activists, radicals, we all know, you know, liberals, we all know that, that the mainstream media is kind of, you know, they're not telling the whole story, and that is putting it mildly. But today on the program, we have senior economist from the Center for Economic Policy and Research, Dean Baker. You know, Dean, he writes Beat the Press, where he comments on the reality and non-reality of some of today's uh, not-so-accurate, most-of-the-time, uh, corporate-friendly economic reporting. Dean is going to talk to us about the continued media disinformation around the Build Back Better Act and Reconciliation Bill, and we're going to ask him about the economic effects of both of those things and when we're going to feel them. Are we going to feel them soon? This is exciting. I also... Since we did this interview earlier, I also want to break to you that I did kind of squeeze in a personal question about whether it was a good idea to sell my used car now and buy a new one or what the deal is with that. And uh, it's nice to have an economist weigh in on, on such things. Anyway, here is my interview with Dean Baker. Hope you enjoy it. The continued media disinformation around the Build Back Better Act and Reconciliation Bill and the economic effects of both of those things has been staggering. Earlier this week, Representative Maliotakis of Staten Island, of all places, was on the news giving credit to President Trump for laying the groundwork for the infrastructure bill that Biden just passed. It's totally crazy. There's more lies out there, though, and here to give us the truth about everything, Dean Baker, senior economist at the Center for Economic and Policy Research and writer-creator of Beat the Press, where Dean comments on the reality behind some of today's not-so-accurate economic reporting. Dean, welcome back to the program. Thanks for having me on, Juliana. So can we talk about the infrastructure bill that was just passed? What effects do you believe we might see in the economy? Will they be tangible to average Americans? Well, they will be tangible. But one of the things that I think people should understand is we probably are not going to see much of that soon. Um, a lot of this is infrastructure. And of course, it was a big joke back in 09, 2010 with Obama stimulus that there are no shovel ready projects. Now, that's, of course, overdone. But a lot of these are projects like building a new tunnel under the Hudson River between New Jersey and Manhattan. That's not even going to get started probably till 223, 224. You don't just build that overnight. Mm -hmm. So you have a lot of things like that. Now, there are things like replacing lead pipes that we will see work on very soon. Um, extending broadband. We will be seeing progress on that very soon. So, and also the incentives for, for clean energy, we will see uh, companies recognize those uh, incentives for electric cars, uh, charging stations. So some of those we'll be seeing probably 222, but much of the impact of this, we aren't gonna feel for years. So we'll be very lucky if uh, that tunnel under the Hudson River is completed by the end of the decade. My guess is we're probably talking later than that. It's very important. I don't mean to trivialize it. It's very important, which should have been done years ago, but um, a lot of this won't be felt for some period of time. It, it will start being felt under the next Republican uh, administration and then they can take credit for it. Well, one of the things you mentioned, uh, the representative from Long Island, uh, I don't know if she's, well, Staten I'm sure she's Island. heard by now. 
Staten Island. I'm Who's sorry. Staten totally Island. different islands, but very similar. Yeah, yeah. No, no. I know enough <laughs> in New York. I was just a slip of the tongue. Yeah. But anyhow, uh, Donald Trump denounced her, denounced all the Republicans who supported the bill, which includes, of course, Mitch McConnell in the Senate. So um, anyhow, uh, she might want to give Donald Trump credit, but he doesn't want to take it. Ooh, those coattails are very slippery. You got to watch out. <laughs> Jump out. Yep, that's for sure. That's uh, well, uh, they they chose their horse, and we'll see how she rides it. <laughs> Which sections of the remaining Build Back Better Act do you think will have the most positive effect on the economy as it stands now? Well, uh, certainly the uh, child tax credit's a real big deal. I mean, the, the the act would extend that, so that's already in place. But the question is extending it past 222. Um, in fact, I think as it stands now, it ends at the, this year if they don't extend it. So that's very important. Uh, Pre-K is very important, both for uh, law and making it easier for, for parents to work, but also we know it's very important for children, particularly for low moderate income, from low and moderate income families. Um, child care, we'll have to see what that looks like, but if that gets preserved, again, a very big deal, both for the kids, but also, again, allowing parents to work. We know that's been a huge issue in the pandemic that a lot of parents, mostly mothers, find that they can't work because they can't have uh, quality child care, affordable child care for their kids, and they will get that with this bill. So I'd say those are the biggest things. I would have loved to seen progress on Medicare expansion. We'll see if anything ends up in there. Um, it's Medicare, of course, uh, has been relatively little changed since it was designed in 65. We badly need things like dental coverage, um, eye coverage, hearing coverage. We'll have to see what comes in there. I also would very much love to see an out-of-pocket cap because it's crazy with the Hi. current Medicare. I mean, it's a good program, but it pays 80% of your bills. But if you have a bill that's $100,000, $200,000, as some people will, um, they don't have that money. They, they can't pay the 20%. Mm -hmm. so, so it really needs to be modernized, and I hope we can at least make some progress towards that. What are the sticking points in the reporting about these issues that are misleading or just blatantly false? Well, one of the things, uh, I'll point to two things. One is that they almost never put the numbers in any context. So the original yes. proposal coming out of the Senate Budget Committee was three and a half trillion. And they never point out this is a 10 year expenditure. So it's it's a little more complicated than that because some of them are, are five years, eight years, but whatever. The point was it's not in one year. So that really was telling people almost nothing. They also often threw in the adjective massive. So I think a lot of people think it's called the massive spending bill. Yes. Um, the, the other part on, on, on that side is that let's take it over 10 years. Again, it's a little simplification, but you have three and a half trillion over 10 years. And now we're talking about 1.8. So we're talking about somewhere between 180 billion and, and 350 billion. Is that a lot of money? Well, it is to you and me. But to the federal government, uh, 170 billion, 180 billion, if that's what we're talking about now is annual expenditure, that's about seven tenths of a percent of GDP. It's less than a quarter of the military budget. Um, exactly. That's, that's important. You have to give it some context. So there was a real effort to say, oh, this is this enormous, massive, huge, it's, it's important. It's not a trivial amount of money, but the federal government has spent this much before and often much, much larger without even raising a, without even blinking an eye. You go back to 2001 and we started the war in Iraq, we increased the military budget by about one and a half percentage points of GDP. That would be about 300 billion a year. And again, no one batted an eye. I mean, that was okay. We had to do that. And we probably didn't have to do that, but whatever, that was the sentiment. And uh, we, we've, didn't worry about how we're going to pay for it. And when there's something important, you, you you spend the money. And in this case, of course, they are actually proposing to pay for it with tax increases on the wealthy and on corporations, basically taking back part of the, the Trump tax cuts from 217. So why I not think all of the tax cuts that Trump put in? Why only some? And why not go beyond that? Well, they're not even going to be able to do that because you have two Democratic senators. I should pick on uh, Senator Sinema in particular because she's been the bigger obstacle here who doesn't seem to want them to take back any of it. So so in terms of what would be reasonable, yeah, I mean, the, the wealthiest people in the country, U.S. corporations, they didn't need tax cuts. So taking it back, I think, would be just fine. I noticed but that they in, call the cinema and mansion, they, a, a lot of times the news uh, refers to them as moderate Democrats or centrist Democrats. And I think they should be called, you know, something more extremist Democrats, because to the Democratic Party as it stands now, they literally are extremely on the right 
Well, a friend of mine came up with what I thought was a very fair and neutral term. Just call them holdouts because that's what they are, you know, because you get to the situation, you call them moderate, you call them centrist. That implies a political philosophy. And I can't say I've studied either of them closely. But yeah, well, I don't think I don't think you find evidence of a coherent political philo philosophy in either of them. So you could say, yeah, they're responsive to corporate interests, which I yeah. believe to be true. That's but what, but but if you don't want to be pejorative, just say they're holdouts because that that is what defines them right now. We don't know their political we philosophy. We know their honestly. <laughs> well, I, mean, I don't mind them being pejorative, but I'm just saying, <laughs> if I'm talking to someone at the New York Times, they aren't going to want to use a pejorative term. So I'll say, why don't you just use a neutral term that accurately defines them? Because you, you don't know that, that cinema is a centrist. Centrist against what? You don't know that Manchin's a moderate. Moderate against what? He's a holdout. That's why we're talking about them. Absolutely. Oh, gosh. Um, you also said, uh, you, you said a moment ago about the, we just got off uh, talking to a national security expert about climate change. And um, you said the military budget and how we didn't, we should have compared the spending on the Build Back Better to what is in the military budget, which is much larger. Isn't the military budget also basically a jobs program? Because a lot of that money goes back to these people's, our Congress people's districts, uh, districts that have Raytheon. I come from uh, uh, Drummond is near where I, where I grew up. There's, isn't it kind of a jobs program? Absolutely. And it's it's important to understand, you know, again, we could argue where the military is doing things we like, where it's doing things we don't like. But the fact that a lot of companies are making money on it, that's indisputable. So Raytheon, when they say if, if someone in Congress wants to cut a program that they're the main supplier for, they're going to be arguing about it. And they're going to say, oh, it's really important because we need this to protect us against China or whoever they might think we're claiming we're protecting ourselves mm -hmm. from. But they make money on it. That's just a fact. So the idea that this is all just about national security, well, no, these companies, again, maybe they believe this is important. I have no idea. But they absolutely know they make lots of money on it. So that's a part of the story that shouldn't be left out. By the way, I, I've been around long enough. I recognize how politics is done. And this is one of the reasons why I think much of the Biden package is so important on climate change is that it gets a foot in the door. So when you have more companies that are making money, producing clean energy, producing electric cars, producing batteries to store energy, they're going to be pushing. They're going to be like the military contractors. They're going to say, hey, you have to give us more. So in that sense, you know, the people who com complain correctly that what he's put on the table is grossly inadequate. And of course, Congress isn't going to give him everything he asked for. They're absolutely right. But it's still a huge, huge deal because as we get more companies that stand to profit from producing clean energy, producing electric cars, there's going to be more political pressure to support a, a faster and more and larger transition. Oh, well, that will be great, and I'm looking forward to that. We can't we can't possibly go fast enough after the conversation I just had about state collapse and impending doom. You know, uh, yeah, as fast as possible would be would be excellent. Yeah, no, it's a huge deal, and it, it's you can't exaggerate the impact. And I just. You know, I, I, it's a generational thing. I mean, I think of the things I've been able to enjoy. I've been up to Alaska a couple of times and um, I enjoy seeing wolves in the wild, which I've been had been lucky enough to do. I, I'd like to think future generations would have that option. You know, in addition to everything else that we all recognize about rising sea levels and yeah, the, the option to just like have food, <laughs> you know, that like would be good, at, too. That would be good, too. Food. Yeah. Yes. Um, when, it, when it comes to like the more granular parts of the economy, we're seeing uh, what I would consider a sharp rise in gas prices, in food prices. Can you give us some context for why this is going on and uh, how dangerous is it to the economy as a whole? Well, the gas price story is that we saw a huge cutback in demand associated with the pandemic. This isn't a U.S. phenomenon. It's a worldwide phenomenon. Of course, gas prices, oil prices, I should say, are worldwide. And we're coming back from that now. So the economy is growing rapidly. Uh, we're well above now the pre-pandemic levels and likely to be further above in the, in the current quarter. And that's true everywhere. That's true in Europe. That's true in, in Japan, China. Um, so there's a big increase in demand for oil and all forms of energy, really. And the supply, a lot of supply was idle during the, the pandemic. And it hasn't all come back online. 
So we have much more demand than supply, which presumably is a temporary phenomenon. Now, I have to say, I sort of have mixed feelings. Do you want a lot more oil to be pumped out of the ground? Well, if you want lower prices, then I guess you do. But uh, but that, as we know, is very problematic. So that's the story with energy. With food, I think a lot of it is supply chain issues. So we've been hearing about this and we've, you know, the focus has always been the docks and the imported goods sitting on the docks. That is part of the story, but it's only part of the story. A lot of it is moving goods around in the U.S. And in fact, the reason the goods are piling up on the docks is they don't have enough trucks and truckers to move it from the docks. And that happens internally as well. So you've seen a huge increase in shipping costs, and obviously food is an item that has to be shipped quickly. So a lot of uh, a, a lot of uh, manu- a lot of wholesalers have to pay higher shipping costs, and that gets passed on in higher food costs. I should also point out, though, food prices are always erratic. So there's been a lot of hype in the media about the big rise in food prices, and we just got the data today from the the Bureau of Labor Statistics. It's 5.4 percent over the last year. It was actually higher. The the rate of inflation was actually higher in food prices in the spring of last year. And if you want to go back a little bit in 211, it was much higher. It was over 6%. So I know that yeah. hits a lot of people, but this is not this is not like some um, unprecedented story. We've seen this many times in the past. I know, but it's not like they went down and then they raised up another 5%. So if we take the past five years or the past six, seven years, I mean, it seems like those these rises are, are higher than one might expect to be normal. Well, I, mean, I certainly they're certainly rising we... faster than wages can keep up with spending to, to get. Well, food. actually, at the bottom end, a lot of workers are seeing very rapid pay increases. So restaurant workers, their wages, hourly wages, risen 12.4 percent over the last year. And if you look at the bottom quintile more generally, bottom 20 percent of uh, workers, it's risen about 10 percent over the last year. So their wages are more than keeping pace with food prices. Um, when you get more towards the middle, that's less that's true. About so. my wages, Dean. My wages. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can talk about mine too. Not doing great, but uh, <laughs> but anyhow, you know, if we talk about much of the population, again, particularly at the bottom, they are doing well. How this pans out in in uh, the months, months and year ahead, hard to say. But for now, at least they're doing pretty well. The other point, I think I made this earlier that a lot of the inflation that we're seeing are things like u- new and used cars. Used cars, I think, have risen like 28% over the last year. Mm-hmm. Well, that's almost certainly temporary. That's the supply chain shortage, particularly semiconductors. There's there's a worldwide shortage of semiconductors. We always had tight supply. There was a big fire, a fire in a big factory in Japan that idled it and until that one's back online or we have others uh, expanding capacity, there will be a shortage of semiconductors, which limits how many cars are being built. But at some point that will be reversed. And instead of just seeing price in inflation in cars, used cars slow, that's going to be reversed. We might see very rapid declines in, in car prices and particularly. So used you're car saying prices. I should trade mine in now is what you're telling me. <laughs> well, if you could get by without a car for a while, because right. if you're going to buy another car, then you don't you don't end up ahead on that deal. But if right. you could say uh, trading your car today and wait four, five, six months to get another car, you're likely to do pretty well. Hey, I like this. Uh, adv- I'm just having you on the show for personal uh, advice. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm usually hesitant on giving uh, personal, but I feel pretty confident. <laughs> and that's actually why, well, I'm not doing that myself. I'm delaying. I want to uh, get get a new used car, um, mm-hmm. but I'm delaying doing that until the prices fall because I would be a net loser trading in for, you know, more valuable, higher price. Uh, yes, we'll take car. advantage of people who absolutely need a car right now and desperate condition. <laughs> I have a friend who did that. She was very happy. She got a very good price for her uh, used car. You know, I, I, we're normally you're a regular guest and I'm glad to have you back on here. But some questions that have been kicking around in my mind since a few months ago when you were last on, uh, we over the summer, we saw an enormous amount of climate change related destruction. We saw the fires out west. I got hit by two hurricanes and I live not in hurricane area. So, okay. Um, Plus there was flooding. There's, you know, are we seeing a a toll on the economy at this point or is the United States economy able to absorb this? Oh, we're definitely seeing a toll. I mean, those, those, we've idled some capacity. One of the, um, one of the sources, supply chain problems, if you like, is you had a lot of capacity idled in the Gulf and Louisiana chemicals. So, 
uh, I remember there's here, there's a shortage of a number of paints and that's because chemicals used to make paints come out of the Louisiana area and uh, you had plants that were shut down uh, mm. for several months. Mm. Um, so, so we're seeing that when you mentioned New York, obviously you have to, um, you have people that can't go to work. Um, then you have uh, big expenses in repairing the damage. Um, so we're seeing that. And where I am in uh, the Southwest, we have severe drought. So that uh, that's affected what, you know, our agriculture here. I mean, we don't have necessarily that much agriculture, but what we have here is uh, we have a cow economy. So uh, people graze cattle and uh, feed them some alfalfa. The drought, the, the, they haven't been able to graze their cattle. A lot of them have sold their cattle and uh, are getting out of the business. So that's, this is going to have an impact. And, you know, one of the ironies, I don't know if irony is the best word here, but we're likely to be seeing higher food prices. We're seeing it now, but not just as a cyclical thing, the pandemic, but on an ongoing basis because of climate change. And, you know, Republicans are going to blame if, you know, if the, if we have a Democrat in the White House, Republicans will be very happy to blame the Democrat, even though they've been the one for decades leading the charge against any action on climate change. The Democrats have not always been as aggressive as we might like, but the Republicans have been near unanimous in opposing any action. Have you seen any reporting uh, in the financial times, in the financial um, financial media sphere that talks about the connection uh, that we're seeing with the increasing food prices and climate change? I have seen zero other than, you know, like people who report on climate change and the potential for this. There have been some, but it's been pretty haphazard. So, you know, one of the things I would love to see, uh, we have a debate now over uh, whether Jerome Powell should be reappointed as Fed chair. And a lot of people have been critical of him or the Fed for not being more aggressive and doing anything like that. And one of the things I think they could do that'd be tremendously useful is to do thorough analyses of how climate change is and will be affecting different sectors of the economy. Mm. Um, I say that because obviously anyone with the resources could do that. We don't. My center doesn't have a lot of money, but anyone with the resources could do that. But coming from the Fed, it's enormously valuable, and it's the sort of thing that can't be ignored. Mm. So if they are to say, okay, here are all these low-lying areas where there's a very high risk of flooding over the next 10, 15, 20 years, well, it becomes very hard for a bank to go ahead and make mortgages to these houses that they know are very likely to, to face flood damage, at least unless they get flood insurance. And of course, flood insurance is very expensive, so then no one will be able to afford the houses. So that would get both get them to, in effect, do what we want them to do, but also drive it home. I mean, you keep having this idea like, oh, this is this is an optional thing. It's like, you know, oh, I'm going to get a new suit. You know, yeah, that'd be nice. I'd like to get a new suit. Uh, yeah, but if I don't get it, it's no big deal. It's not optional. I mean, mm -hmm. we're, we, we are paying a big price and we're going to pay a much bigger price if we don't take aggressive action to, to limit the damage we do in terms of uh, emitting greenhouse gases. And my final question for you, even we've gone all over the map and I feel like I'm up to date almost. <laughs> uh, housing prices are have skyrocketed over the course of the last, oh, I don't know, you could have, maybe you'll have a better sense of the timeline um, than I would. Is that ever going to even out? I would imagine not because as people move away from the coasts and those places that get hit hardest by climate change, won't that put a demand on housing in other areas? Uh, then there's the supply chain issues. I'm paying like $18 for a piece of lumber. Uh, you know, tell me. Yeah, we, we have a few different things going on. Now, house prices had been rising um, before the pandemic. And I think uh, two factors there. One, we had definitely underbelt so we're buzzing very rapidly during the bubble years, 2000 to 2006, 2007. And then construction fell through the floor. So fell by more than 50%. Gradually it's inched back up, but we have real short fund housing that we are starting to make up now. We're building uh, housing at a much more rapid rate. Um, when we have supply chain issues dealt with, we'll probably see it grow a little more. Um, so that'll be a factor reigning in house prices. The other thing, interest rates have been extraordinarily low. Um, that predates the pandemic. They fell during the pandemic, but they've risen back somewhat to where they were. They're still lower than, than where they were pre-pandemic. Mm -hmm. I do expect at some point, I'm not saying you know next month and maybe not even next year, but I do expect we will see some rise in mortgage rates, which will have a downward impact on house prices. So just to be clear, I'm not projecting any sort of crash, but if house prices drop 5 or 10% due to, say, a rise in mortgage rates of 
say a percentage point, again, they'd still be historically low, so that wouldn't be a really high mortgage rate. Um, I think that's a very plausible story. I should also mention, and, and this isn't so much because of climate, I mean, maybe in the future, but we are seeing a real shift in, in housing so that the biggest price increases have been in, in relatively low cost areas. So we've seen big price increases in places like Detroit, uh, Minneapolis, a lot of smaller towns, and New York, Boston, the really expensive places, house prices have not been going up rapidly. Well, how far are they up can they go? The one and a half <laughs> bedroom next door to where I used to live is like a million five. I mean, how? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, you might see some declines. Again, I'm not going to predict any sort of crash, but you might see some declines there because you are seeing this is the work from home story that a lot of people find they, they could have an, they could work out of New York, have their office in New York or employer in New York, but <laughs> they could live pretty much anywhere. And people are taking advantage of that. And I think that's a great thing. Dean Baker, senior economist at the Center for Economic and Policy Research, writer, creator of Beat the Press. Thank you so much for being here. It's great to have you back. And uh, I look forward to your return in maybe a month or so. Sounds good. Thanks a lot for having me on. Thanks. Thanks, Dean. You're watching ACT TV. Stay tuned. Stay with us. More to come. Hi. <laughs> Was that great or what? I loved it. I love Dean Baker. I love the fact that he's going to be coming back regularly. Did you learn something? Are you going to sell your car? I'm not. Anyway, uh, I have a lot of great stuff coming up this coming week. Guess who's joining me on the program? I am very excited to say that on Thursday at this very exact time, Ryan Grimm, that's right, from The Intercept and also uh, one of the, well, the sane anchor at... Uh, <laughs> at the the hill uh on 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 youtube's the show is called the rising that made by the hill ryan grimm is joining me on this program to do some headlines isn't that gonna be fun it totally is and then jocelyn who is our normal contributor on this program jocelyn mckerney keats is going to be joining us to talk about the fight for uh justice and voting rights that's been happening on the capitol every week she's been going down there she's been be in there live and she'll be with us to talk about that on Friday. I think we have a couple other things coming up for you on Friday. Still in the works next week, our Thanksgiving show. We'll have uh invest investigate? No, journalist, regular journalist, David Nywert. We know David Nywert. He writes, uh, he wrote before the word fascism became something people were like, oh yeah, that's happening, that's real. Uh, David Nywert was talking about the rise of white christian nationalism the rise of fascism the radical alt-right and their proud boy movements and he took a lot of s-h-i-t for doing that yeah and he's gonna be on our program talking about this rise in christian fundamentalism and the intersection between the, you've seen these tweets right they're coming out in crazy form they're saying do you know they're chanting about jesus as if Jesus would be behind a fascist movement. There's a lot to talk about, and we're going to do that uh, to celebrate Thanksgiving next on uh, next Tuesday on this show. And Jocelyn is joining us again to talk about a book that she has been reading. Next Tuesday, we're going to be talking about what makes people happy. What structures in society are proven to make a happier population. And wouldn't it be nice to like walk into like the big Y or uh, the the Publix or uh, the Trader Joe's in whatever section of the country you live in and not be scared that the guy next to you actually thinks you're the devil and uh, that you eat babies and has a murderous intent toward you. That would be great, right? If people were happier, maybe there wouldn't be so much crazy out there. There'd be more serotonin, more dopamine, less crazy. Anyway, much, much to talk about on that show. I thank you so much for joining us today. Again, I'm Juliana Forlano. Please follow ACT TV across platforms. Uh, and you can follow me 
please do. I have a good time over there over at the Twitters at Juliana Forlano. Thanks, everybody. Dean Baker can be found at the Center for Economic and Policy Research or on his Twitter at Dean Baker 13. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time.